Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Marty Elliott. Along with me today from the Zamboni Company is Braden Bolton. He's our supply chain supervisor from Zamboni Company. And our guest today is Todd Reynolds, president of Uptown Hockey, Inc. out of Brantford, Ontario. Thanks for being on, uh, on the show with us today, Todd. Greatly appreciate it. And, and uh, uh, Braden, I greatly appreciate your time as well. So here's my first <laughs> question. Welcome, yeah, here's Sorry. my first question, G gentlemen. Okay. How do you two know? How do you two know each other? Help us understand. Do you Do you want me to answer that, Todd? Sure. Yeah. Go for it, please. Okay. Well, I I met Todd first at a men's breakfast at at church. Now I don't always go to the breakfasts at church, but this was a men's breakfast that um, when I found out that Todd was going to be the guest speaker, it was one that I certainly wanted to attend. So. I learned probably more of that breakfast than I had at any other men's breakfasts prior to that. But the, the one thing that it caught me that was kind of funny after Todd spoke and he spoke about his life and his faith and, and different things, he, he had two questions for the group of us. And he asked the first question, what father and son uh, won the heart, were the only father and son that won the heart trophy? And I remember sitting there and I was, I said, I know this. And I said, Brett and Bobby Hall, and uh, there was kind of the silence. And so I repeated it and everybody's kind of looking at me and I'm going like, I think that's the right answer. People were shouting out different. And then finally somebody said it and they won this really nice Nashville Predator jersey. And I was like, wow, you know, I wish I would have won. My son was there. So then he said, that's okay. He says, I have one more question. Uh, and it was for tickets to a NHL game. And he asked which, was the last player to not wear a helmet and i was like okay i think i know this one and i'm going to make sure todd knows or todd can hear me rather so i said very loudly craig mctavish and todd seen me heard me and said you're right and uh we got to talk about that after the game or after the, the breakfast we connected and then from there it just kind of unraveled you know Todd and I would would connect here and there, so that was my introduction to Todd Reynolds. Well, how things come full circle. Craig Matavish and I, uh, I didn't go uh, with him to the same elementary school, high school. He was uh, older than me, but uh, we both grew up in the same subdivision in London, Ontario. So what a small world. Wow, <laughs> that's that's great in info. So Todd, let me ask you. Um, Share more about Uptown Hockey Inc. and what your business is, and perhaps uh, some of your clients, and uh, what services your uh, company provides. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, we're a, I'm a second generation hockey agent, uh, following the footsteps of my dad. So Don Reynolds is my father, and and got uh, involved in this industry back in the '80s. Uh, he had a financial planning background and insurance background and had some NHL clients, uh, NHL players as clients in that financial services space. And it really just became a natural outgrowth of his activity with those players. In fact, the, the players uh, at that time liked Don and respected him and and the service that he provided that they actually asked him you know hey don would you consider doing my next contract with the la kings or with the toronto maple leafs um and uh he was a hockey dad you know a hockey um player to a certain degree growing up he loved the game but but he really didn't know uh much about being a hockey agent you know, at that time. So he really got into it um, quite the opposite of what most people, uh, if not all people, uh, would today. In other words, the business, you know, you generally grow your business by starting with young players, prospects, um, you know, 15 to 18 year olds, uh, generally, and, and you recruit those players and, and you try to identify talent and, and hopefully, you know, these players grow and, and become pros. Uh, but he started at the NHL level uh, with a number of players um, and some of them would be familiar to, to you guys and, and the listeners. Uh, 
on the Leafs at that time, Bob McGill, who still does uh, broadcasting work uh, with the Leafs, uh, defenseman, jo- John Anderson, who was a forward, um, Tom Fergus. Uh, so he had a number of different players sort of in that era. And uh, now today uh, we work with a number of players uh, in the NHL on various teams. Uh, I've been in the industry for 24 years or 25 years. And um, we've represented players that have, uh, you know, retired. Keith Primo, who was the captain of the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, Mike Fisher, who was the captain uh, of the Nashville Predators. Uh, Chris Neal, uh, who was the assistant captain of the Ottawa Senators, spent his whole career there. Uh, to players today like Zach Hyman and Kyle Clifford on the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, to uh, Tyler Bertuzzi uh, of the Detroit Red Wings, Mackenzie Blackwood, the goaltender in New Jersey, and many others across the league. So that's um, that, that's a bit of our clientele today, and, and the services that we provide are are many uh, really depends on the, the player that we're working with and, and the situation that we're dealing with, but it can be facilitating um, to negotiating. So obviously we, we do contract negotiations, endorsements, uh, all of those kinds of things. Uh, some, uh, some career planning uh, for players uh, post post career planning as they, as they get to the, the twilight of their NHL career. Uh, there's a number of different things that a hockey agent or, or any sports agent does. And we do all of those, those things either in house or we facilitate them, uh, with experts, uh, outside of our, our company. One, that's a, an amazing lineup, uh, starting with your dad all the way through to, uh, where you are today with the organization, your company, as far as, uh, professional athletes, is there any other, um, uh, professional athletes outside the hockey umbrella, if you will, that, uh, Uptown Hockey represents? There is not at this time. Now we've been asked a lot over the years, um, you know, by say an Olympic athlete or a, a soccer player or a football player. And, and we, we've always uh, just said, you know, we don't, we don't know those sports well enough to do a proper uh, job. And, and we, we have, uh, because we've been in the business so long, we do know people in, uh, you know, that are active in those other sports. So we will refer those, those players. We'll say, look at, uh, we can't help you, but, you know, here's uh, someone who we feel is, is uh, reputable and, knowledgeable that can help you and and uh so we more play matchmaker in those situations right right so let me ask you todd um i'm a uh i'm coming out of junior or entering junior and uh you approach my family and myself uh to be my agent uh what what is it about uptown hockey that makes it stand out compared to some of the other uh, uh known agencies out there that are representing uh profile players that's a good question, and that's something that we're always trying to m- make sure that uh, you know we, we are, are clear with people when we're talking about that. Because I think to a lot of people, you, you know, that that interview agents or agencies, they can be confused, frankly, because everyone seems to talk about the same things. And and uh, uh, for us, it, it would be our our personal uh, attention and, and our relationship with the player. Uh, we keep our numbers limited intentionally so that we're able to do that. And we have very much a, a family feel with our agency. Um, we have a very high retention rate. In other words, we, we usually work with a player from, from you know, 15 or 16 years of age, sometimes 17 or whenever we first get involved with them right through to the end of their career. And we maintain a, a, a friendship that, that goes on, you know, beyond their playing days. So, I would say just, you know, the players, if you were to ask our clients, they would say, you know, it's very much a family type atmosphere. Um, Todd and his people are very responsive. You know, they get back to us quickly. Uh, I know if I have an issue, uh, it's not going to take them a week to to respond to it. Uh, so uh, th- that's the way that we dif- differentiate ourselves. I-, I think anyone in the business who's been in it a long time has relationships with managers and coaches and knows the market uh, of what a player should earn and all of those things. So really what makes us different is 
that we're uh, responsive and uh, th- that we care, that we, you know, the human element is not lost on us. Uh, that's the way my dad always approached the business. That's the way I've always done it. I want to continue to do that. I think sports lacks a bit of, uh, certainly at, at times, uh, a human, uh, where, where is the feeling? Where is the, the care? Uh, you know, these are people that we're, we're talking about. Uh, they're not commodities. And uh, I think that we should we should approach things that way uh, with people and, and show that we care because uh, it's not uh, as glamorous as some people might think. Yeah, being a and, pro and athlete. No, no doubt, no doubt. And especially at a young age, so confused uh, which uh, direction to go. At the end of the day, hopefully, right mentorship uh, uh, system in that process. The old saying is, "I don't care how much you know, but I want to know how much you care." And having those uh, added values, that family value, if you will, that you instill within your organization certainly uh, would hit hit home with uh, many uh, young uh, professionals coming into the league. I'm going to bring uh, Braden into the uh, conversation. Braden, I think you had a couple questions you wanted to ask Todd. Yeah, I got a, I have a couple here for you, Todd. Um, and I'm sure you've probably heard a couple of these uh, over and over again. But was there any one player when you were growing up that inspired you to make a career out of playing hockey or or getting involved with professional hockey, uh, you know, at any capacity, I guess. But was there any standout athlete as a kid you just kind of admired and and had as a mentor? Uh, You know, there was, and there's a a few that that come to mind. And, you know, because of my dad getting involved in the business and then me, of course, uh, being around it, I had an opportunity to see behind the curtain, so to speak, uh, you know, at a young, young age. And I would meet some of these players. In some cases, they weren't even his clients. You know, I would just meet them through, through his clients and so on. And, and uh, I, I was a goaltender, guys. I was a goalie. So, you know, you kind of watch the game from a different perspective and, and you're keying on the goalie and your favorite player is the goalie. And you really aren't that interested in the, in the forwards or the defensemen. Uh, so um, I remember uh, spending time with a goaltender in uh, St. Louis by the name of Ed Stanowski. Uh, I don't know if you remember that name or not. Um, Chico Resch, who was a longtime New Jersey Devils goalie and, and actually now does uh, color commentating for the Devils. Um, you know, they would have had a, a big effect on me back then. I mean, I really followed the goalies closely. I loved Ron Hextall. I loved uh, Billy Smith. I kind of loved that battling, competitive, fiery nature, you know, goaltender. So there's a lot. There's a lot of them. But yeah, these guys inspired me, and I want to be like them. Now, I was going to ask you about Stanley Cup memories. I mean, growing up, there was probably one, or maybe even two, or whatever memories you had of a, of a Stanley Cup win that you just thought really, you know, was special and, and stood out for you. Um, do you have a memory like that that you'd like to share? Or? Uh, you know, I guess I have a lot of memories of watching the Stanley Cup. I watched a lot of hockey when I was young, but but I, I probably played more. And, and since I've gotten into the business, um, you know, I've looked at it from a different perspective. And uh, honestly, Braden, the, the best story I can tell you about the Stanley Cup my 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 fondest memory is taking my son Samuel to the uh, finals in Nashville uh, a few years ago I guess it would be 17 uh, against Pittsburgh 2017 okay and and going to the the, the finals in Nashville uh, we had two clients uh, at the time in Mike Fisher and Kelly Yarncrook who is a Swedish forward on uh, the Predators at the time. And we went to um, what turned out to be the last game in Nashville and in the finals was game six against Pittsburgh, which unfortunately from our standpoint, Pittsburgh won. It was a great series and and we enjoyed it. But what an atmosphere, you know, from a fan standpoint and to be there with my son who at the time was, uh, you know, 12 years old and, and take that in and, and just get uh, to be at the morning skate and, you know, meet, players and all those kinds of things that he got to do that's a memory i'll never forget yeah yeah, just sounds incredible i know there was one of those games i think carrie fisher actually carrie fisher 
That's what yeah. I'm saying. Um, yeah. She yeah. Said, yeah. Was, was it the one that she had sang the national anthem, I believe? At one she, of those games? She, she did sing it at one of those games. That's right. And of course, she was there, you know, in the in the suite uh, every game. And, and uh, they really do a wonderful job in Nashville uh, with the just the the entertainment uh, at one of their games, even in the regular season. You, you know, they, they have um, a number of, of sort of, uh, I guess, music celebrities attending the games and singing the national anthem, even performing between periods. And it's just, it's quite an atmosphere. It's, it's sort of uh, been to obviously like lots of different rinks and, and games all over the league. And to me, Nashville is a unique experience. Yeah, you wouldn't really think, I don't think in terms of Nashville really being a hockey city. I don't know about you, Marty, but you know, I think of Nashville as being like country music, Grand Old Opry, hockey talk, you know, that kind of vibe. But the fact that these people get excited about hockey is, is a really, that's a big deal. That's a, that's a cool deal. You know that the sport has evolved when it's grown down to the South, you know, and these, these types of, you know, like different people are getting excited about it. So yeah, I've been uh, I've been fortunate to be I've been fortunate to be down there uh, for games uh, a couple times uh, during playoff hockey, and uh, that is a hockey town uh, outside Bridgestone Arena. Um, I was fortunate. Uh, Nigel Snur, who's the vice president of vice ops at the uh, at the arena, had me in, and uh, the outside atmosphere. Yeah, I thought what the Raptors and Leafs have outside uh, atmosphere was uh, pretty wild. Uh, <laughs> Bridgestone Arena. That was another story. Uh, I'm sure you've uh, part partake, perhaps Todd, or been uh, been around. Uh, that uh, event. I, yeah, I have Marty. And and are you referring to the, like the Stanley Cup run? Were you down there at that time? Yes. Yes, it yes. was. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Was, yeah, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? It was. I was standing up. Uh, I I want to say it was on the main street there, Margaritaville, on the top top of the patio. Um, after the game, we went back to have a couple pops and uh, just watching. <laughs> The amount of people swarming that facility it was just bees on honey it was pretty crazy it, yeah it yeah. was it was a lot of fun uh and, and the the organization they do a wonderful job just uh engaging the fans and and making it fun um so yeah i really enjoyed that with my son back in 2017 that would be my most memorable stanley cup uh no doubt yeah we sell a lot of machines to Russia, okay? So hockey isn't just played on this side of the continent. We got, you know, lots going on over in Russia. Um, how do you see the KHL compared to the NHL as far as uh, growth and opportunity for players that, you know, may not make it to the NHL or kind of bounce back and forth between leagues or whatever? But is the KHL a league that we got to keep an eye on? Is there a lot of talent over there? There, there is definitely, and uh, I, I, you know, you've seen uh, players probably that you're familiar with in the NHL now who got their start there, you know, or or even became veteran players there and decided to come over a little bit later in their careers to the NHL. Um, so, so there's there's that element or that component. Um, the the I guess our involvement uh, as an agency w with our clientele in the KHL would be more the other way, Braden. In other words, a player who's sort of exhausted themselves professionally uh, in North America. Maybe they they've had a bit of an NHL career, up and down player. Um, you know, primarily in the American Hockey League, uh, which is the top affiliate league in in North America, as you guys would know. And they, they, they just feel like their their prospects are finished in, in, in terms of being an NHL regular. So they, they will uh, have uh, some very attractive offers put to them um, or put to us uh, for them to go to the KHL and play. And oftentimes they can play a more prominent role there, uh, which is more fun, of course, right? When you're going to the rink and you know you're going to play and contribute, it's more exciting than when you wonder if you're going to be a fair forward uh, and and play five minutes. Absolutely. Uh, so so that that would be uh, you know certainly financially they can do very well over there, and um, you know if they look at their their age and say, boy, I only have uh, you know maybe three or four years left. 
I really need to uh, set up my family financially for, for life after hockey, you can get ahead quite well by doing that. Okay. No, I, I've heard that the conditions over there are quite the same as they are perhaps, you know, playing over here, uh, stories about like getting medical attention and, and different things or whatever. Yeah. So, um, do, you, do you have a story or, or maybe even a little comparison that you could, you'd like to share? Um, so we kind of get a feel of what it would actually like be like playing over there. Certainly. So, so there's all kinds of uh, stories that, that that you hear, you, you know, that, that you guys maybe have heard or read horror stories, so to speak, um, about uh, you know various teams uh, fr from the the plane that the players fly on uh to the the living uh conditions to you know the the grocery stores uh, or, or or food that's available even to their pay uh you know in some cases there, there's been teams that, that just simply don't pay the players or or uh cut a player uh fire them that's that's their expression they fire a player after two games or or four games or just things that in North America wouldn't happen are, are completely foreign to us. Um, uh, an owner walking in a dressing room between periods and yelling at a, a player who's not producing and, and, and releasing them, firing them uh, between periods. So those are some of the things that, that we've seen over the years in, in uh, some of these leagues, uh, KHL and others. And uh, I, I think it's gotten a lot better and a lot more professional and and uh, and structured and organized and and uh, not not uh, uh, really resembling the earlier days. But uh, there, there's been some interesting uh, times in that league. There's no question. And I think my last uh, you know comment on that is. What a great experience for someone from North America who's enjoyed our lifestyle, our, our ways of living, to go over there and experience that for six months and come back with a, uh, maybe a, a renewed sense of gratitude and um, appreciation for what we have and how we live. And, uh, you know, just to be, be thankful, I think it's a great life experience. Yeah, yeah. A well, good answer, Todd. Yeah, um, Marty. Yeah, I'm gonna flip it back to you. Um, I know we've got a list of questions here that we were hoping to get through. I've got a couple more. I don't know if you have anything kind of pressing or whatever. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Uh, I, I'm just gonna keep it over the European uh, market uh, for a sec, uh, Todd. Uh, perhaps uh, you can share with the audience a little bit about, uh, you've talked about your organization, uh, perhaps your team, and uh, what markets uh, you presently are in and that, that you represent. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So we, we really are active uh, primarily in North America and um, Sweden. So, so we, we have a, an office in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and uh, we have a gentleman there by the name of Christian Sjogren, who uh, runs our European office out of Stockholm. He is uh, a former uh, national team player in Sweden and pro player in the SHL, which is Sweden's top league, and uh, manages our European clients um, from, from that side of the pond. So... Uh, we have players in uh, the KHL, in the Swedish Elite League, in the DEL in Germany, uh, many different leagues in Europe. And then uh, in North America, we are active uh, primarily in uh, U.S. college hockey, uh, Division One college hockey in, in all of the different conferences, and the OHL in Ontario. Uh, we do some work in, in the Western Hockey League and the Quebec Major Junior League. Uh, but not as much as we do in Ontario. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the ECHL, the AHL, and the NHL. So uh, the great thing about this uh, this sport, I think, anyway, it's, it's interesting to me and it's a lot of fun, is you can work with a player from Detroit, Michigan, and, um, you know, it's relatively close to home. It's, it's uh, three hours or so away, but he can end up playing in, Magnitogorsk in the KHL or maybe Anaheim 
uh, in California uh, or or Toledo, Ohio in the ECHL. I, I mean, so our depending how a player's career uh, unfolds, it ends up taking us many different places. Right. Do you have any clients that are uh, coming into the draft uh, uh, this year? Uh, maybe share a little bit about that. Uh, I've seen enough drafts come and go where um, you want to reserve judgment on 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 the draft or or uh, refrain from expressing disappointment that you didn't get a certain pick so that you can pick a certain player because as you guys know oftentimes the fourth pick turns out to be much better than the first pick um or 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 even a player who's you know much later than the fourth pick Look so at Luke Robitaille. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think he was introduced on your podcast as the best 127th. 170th. 170th, 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 170th yeah. pick ever. Which, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you got a good chuckle over. But, I mean, um, you know, Jamie Benn, uh, I think, was a fifth-round pick. Uh, and, you know, as a captain and, and a, a Hart Trophy uh, winner and, and so on uh, in Dallas. So, I, I, I don't really – think the you know the, the draft is just a moment in time it's a snapshot it's saying this is where the players are now yes there's projection built into that of course and teams are trying to project but that's unknown to all of us we don't know how much uh, a certain player is up against his ceiling how, how close he is to his ceiling or how much development there is still in in, in another player so yeah. that, that that's uh, that's what makes scouting so difficult and that's what makes our industry, you know, even more difficult because we are, we are prospecting three years earlier than the NHL draft, really. Right. Right. So. Yep. Yep. So so it's it's hard enough when you look at NHL drafts. You say, oh, I can't believe you know Team X took that guy in the second round. What were they thinking? Well, obviously they liked what they saw, and they thought that there was a lot of upside there. Um, but but we're doing that, you know, far earlier. And, and uh, you know, in some cases, the player hasn't even played junior or or uh, or college hockey yet. Right. So, yeah. So it's it's difficult. Um, uh, but uh, you know, the one player that I'll plug uh, for this draft upcoming is a player by the name of Riley McCourt. And Riley McCourt played uh, this past year. He's from St. Catharines, Ontario. Right. And he, he played for the Flint Firebirds in the OHL uh, with another one of our clients, Ty Delandria, who was a first round pick to the Dallas Stars. And this mm -hmm. player, Riley McCord, has really come on this year. Uh, and, and he's a prospect for the draft, but he's missed the draft a few years. And we mm -hmm. think that his career path resembles that of another client of ours by the name of Sean Dersey. And I don't know if you guys remember, but Sean Dersey was a second round pick to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And he was involved in the trade with Jake Muzzin that brought Muzzin to L.A. So Sean Dersey is now with the L.A. Kings. And we think he's going to be a, a top four regular defenseman in the, and, and work a power play for the L.A. Kings down the road. He's a fantastic prospect. Yeah, let me bring uh, Braden back in. Uh, Braden, you got a couple more questions you want to ask Todd? I know you probably deal with uh, different personalities and, and people expecting different things or whatever. but was there ever a player that had a an interesting or crazy demand that you've never heard of as part of their contract negotiation that they wanted something unusual built into that? Was there any yeah. stand up? You wouldn't have to yeah. name them. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I, I won't name them, but I, I'll I'll say this. It, it, actually, usually it's the parents of of younger players, um, and and generally our our families are are great and and uh so on but the odd time uh hockey uh can change people it, it can you know people a mom or a dad they can get wrapped up in it and lose their focus so we had this player that was drafted in the ohl okay so he's, he's 16 years old and he was a high pick in the ohl and uh, as you guys may know, we negotiate education packages with the OHL team. And so we put together a contract, which uh, outlines a number of benefits for the player, including their post-secondary um, uh, education, uh, like a, a scholarship fund for the player. 
So I got an email from this dad one morning. I opened it up while we were kind of in the midst of this negotiation with the OHL team. And there was a laundry list of items from this dad that he wanted. And one of them was he wanted his son on the side of the city buses, like promoting his, his son. Like he wanted his son to be the face of the team and be featured on the, on the, <laughs> on the on, yeah, on the on the side of the buses, and I just I that was just one one of like ten items that were were completely like like you you wouldn't even go to the team and and uh, and mention them because you would just of course lose all respect or, you know they'd lose all respect for you uh, so so the odd time we get things like that where where someone just gets completely ahead of themselves um, but but that one stands out for me. And, and you still have to maintain a level of professionalism when you when you go back and you you say to the dad or the mom or whoever's wanting that in their contract, um, in, you know, in a reasonable way, why you can't, you know, react to that um, request and uh, without right. laughing. <laughs> yeah. I, well, that's the that's the thing. And for for some of these these I mean, most of these kids, I mean, they're they're innocent in all of it. Like they're they they're not even aware of, of what their parents are are asking for. Um, so so I had nothing. It was no reflection on on the the young man uh, at the time. It was just the the dad thought that he could um, create. Uh, sort of manufacture uh, an NHL hockey player by, by doing all of these things. And, you, you know, the, the game is played on the ice. Uh, the NHL teams don't care if you're on the side of a city bus. Uh, they care how you play. And that, that's where their opinion is going to be formed. Oh, boy. It, it would actually be kind of comical if the son didn't know that was going to happen and, and you actually agreed to that. And he was outside and he watched his face go by on the side of a bus. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think maybe that father might have uh, been in the London market uh, looking at the city of London buses uh, when uh, when when uh, Max uh, Domi and uh, and Mitch uh, were playing for the Knights won the Memorial Cup. Let me add uh, in two thousand that year, so they uh, they they had something to put on the bus and uh, yeah, for something like that's that, different so. and that's and that's fine. And if the team wants to do it, you know, uh, wonderful. But to go to the team and ask before you've played a game in the league, uh, I thought was a, a little little much. Yeah, That's definitely. Crazy. If you were going to build a dream team, okay, from your childhood to present day, and you had to pick three forwards, two defensemen, and a goalie, would you be able to do that? Like, who would be your guys? Oh man, who would be my guys? I, I would probably pick players that stood out to me based on their hockey cards. You know, when I was a when I was a kid, and and I'd say that Hare would have something to do with. So I'd pick Guy Lafleur, uh, Lanny McDonald, uh, Craig McTavish, and um, uh, who would I pick on the blue line? Um, That's tough. Let me revisit the blue line. Uh, in goal, I, I would probably pick uh, maybe Kelly Rudy. You know that that hair, that headband that he had, and the old Joe yeah. helmet. When yeah, he that, those, the Kings. yeah, when he played for the Kings, that was a good look. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Almost you know, a lot, I, I have to inter interject. A lot of people don't know this. Do you know what that material was from on his headband? Do you know where, where don't. You, you don't? No. It was his his blue long johns. He used to was cut it? it. It was. He used to cut one leg off, and he—that's what his uh, his headband was. Was a leg of his blue uh, lawn johns, those uh, kind of uh, fibery ones, um, the dimples in them. And uh, yeah, and that came from his mouth, by the way. I'm just sharing. <laughs> wow. Okay. I I, yeah. I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't know there's, that. Uh, there's some trivia for you. Interesting. Uh, I, I'd probably on, on defense. I'd take Borea Salming because anyone who you know went through that kind of an injury and uh, you know was was that good a player. I was a young guy watching the Leafs and so on. I always liked Borea Salming as a player. Um, mm -hmm. Little Jofa helmet. Yes. I agree. Uh, and and then maybe the. The other, the other defenseman, uh, maybe maybe Doug Wilson, you, you know, the GM in in 
San Jose. Uh, he played with no helmet. So we'll, we'll give one of the five that has a helmet, but it's so small. It's like a styrofoam cup anyway, those Jofas. <laughs> uh, that's great. Oh, so who was your goal? Did you say who your goalie was? Sorry. I, I'd say Kelly Rudy. I, I think he Kelly does, Rudy. you know, I think he does a good job too uh, uh, on, you know, commentating and uh, he's an insightful guy and, and he's not critical, you know, of the players. He, he gets it. Um, I think he's pretty balanced and fair. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask initially. Have you ever had an opportunity to drive Zambo with that? I'm I have not, and I'm super disappointed about that. And, and I, I listened to some of your previous uh, guests uh, comment on that, and I thought, you know what? I, I've never driven a Zamboni, and I've always been around them, close to them, admired them. Um, I remember Maple Leaf Gardens you know, as a young kid going back, you know, while my dad was talking to NHL players and watching the Zambonis and, you know, back in the day uh, at, at Maple Leaf Gardens. And, and I mean, my favorite Zamboni is the one built on the Jeep chassis that you have in your showroom in Brantford, Ontario, uh, yes. that CJ5. I mean, I, I'm a Jeep collector, as you guys I think Braden knows that I, I, I'm a, I'm a hobbyist. I'm a, a passionate, you know, vintage Jeep aficionado. And uh, that one speaks to me. Uh, that one is just amazing. And uh, the history of Zamboni combined with using Jeeps, you know, way back in the fifties and sixties is uh, to me really special. So if I had one, I could drive, that would be the one that nice off green, you know, so, uh, pastel green uh, one in your showroom. I, I would uh, I would drive that down the road. That thing's so cool. Well, next time for, next time Frank uh, wants to change up the uh, museum here in the office uh, for staging and needs to be moved, we'll be calling. <laughs> you. Oh, it's awesome! It is so it's it's great. Absolutely love it. Oh, that's funny. That's a good answer. I knew you that you loved Jeeps, and um, when when you first came in here, you were I remember. I caught you looking at that machine and and you were just amazed and and I could tell your passion and you just loved that thing and I was built on that Jeep chassis and uh, oh yeah if if it ever becomes available for sale you know it could go in my museum instead <laughs> I, I would I would be a I would be a prospect for that purchase it's it's just a it's really really cool and uh, I I think Zamboni started using flat fenders like Willie's flat fender Jeeps back in the 50s if I recall um there, there were some, some use back to, that's back that's then great. todd are you from this area were you born and raised in this area so, so i was i was born uh and raised in uh, etobicoke so I, I sort of grew okay. up a little closer to the city and i, I played my minor hockey uh, we lived in oakville for a time we lived in etobicoke sort, sort of in that area and then um my family s slowly sort of moved out you know further away from the city and uh but but I've spent a lot of time yeah in that area of Burlington, Ancaster, and uh, now Paris, Ontario. Really close to home then from the uh, Brantford facility here in uh, Brantford. So yes. let me uh, uh, throw some Zamboni trivia at you. You ready? Yes. Okay, so there's two types of uh, uh, machines that we produce. One's electric, uh, as uh, we have more than one, but and then fuel powered. Which one is heavier? I'm going to say the electric one. Okay. Probably Someone, wrong. So, oh no, you're right. Oh, good answer. okay. We, good answer. I'm just thinking electric cars are are heavy and uh, batteries are heavy and I think they're getting lighter though. The technology is coming along, but uh, um, they certainly are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our, yeah. Our lead, our uh, AC lead acid uh, uh, machines are definitely uh, heavier than our uh, fuel powered. So our 77 inch blade that's attached to uh, the actual conditioner of the machine on the blade holder. Any idea how much roughly it weighs? 77 inch blade, I'm going to say weighs uh, 250 pounds. Wow. <laughs> You're a little off on that one. 57 okay. pounds. Oh, 57 pounds. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wasn't even close. So Todd, let's turn the, let's turn the tables around. Uh, time for uh, you. Perhaps uh, you might have a couple of trivia questions that uh, either Braden and I uh, have an answer for. I don't know. The problem is, it's gonna co it's gonna cost us another set of tickets or something to a game if Brady because Brady he gets everything right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he's always he's on it. So Braden, I, did I miss your first answer? Like, did you have it right and I, I didn't hear you properly and somebody else? Is that what happened? 
Yeah, that, that's what happened. And, and I think after repeating the answer a few times, someone caught wind, they heard me, and they just repeated the answer, but they said it louder. And, oh, uh, and so you, you really would have won both. I would have won both. I would have given the one away. But the, the first gift I remember was the National Predators, and it was from Mike Fisher's 1000 game, I believe. Ah, uh, yeah. And you, had, yes. you had the signed brochure. You had, you know, a few things from that game. I was pretty excited. And anyway, you, you could tell wow. I'm still not bitter. You, I'm, still, I'm not bitter about it, though. You could tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, you're, just, you're not over it yet. Sorry. I'm so <laughs> exactly. sorry. But um, yeah, shoot, shoot away. Oh, okay, so uh, let's see. What what was the name of the arena that the Ottawa Senators first played in when they came into the NHL? Oh wow, that's a great question. That was downtown Ottawa, uh, uh, where the sixty sevens played, and they moved out to their own location. But you got me. Uh, I'm not going to Google either. I don't know. Can you, no. can you give us a hint, Todd? uh it's a it's a common it's a common name in fact um i i think in brantford we have a, an arena by the same name oh like the civic center that's right there you are oh, wow. I, 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 I believe that i believe that's the correct answer they played at the civic center which i i think only had stands on on you know two sides maybe or something right it was same right? set up as the North Bay Memorial, where uh, before they did the Reno, uh, where right. the Italian are now. They had three uh, sides and uh, one wall. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Braden, uh, I think he, I think you got that one, Braden. <laughs> yep, partial uh, credit anyway. I had some help, so I'll, I'll get one ticket for that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna bring this to a close. I I just want to thank you, Todd for taking and spending the time with us today on this uh, podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Um, learned a lot about your your industry, your company, um, great valuable information. And uh, again, thank you for coming on with us today. And uh, Braden, thank you for uh, sharing and co-hosting with me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we wanna thank everyone for listening to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Uh, by the way, if you have a question uh, for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or requests to info at Zamboni.com. And for more information or additional podcast episodes, you can visit our Zamboni.com forward slash podcast or search the Ask the Zamboni experts on the Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify Podcasts. Again, this is your host, Marty Elliott with Braden Bolton, wishing you an ice day.